Um, so narcoleptics, you probably have seen in um, discussions of it, but basically narcoleptics are sleepy. They fall asleep while talking, they fall asleep um, while eating, driving, which is what scares us. But the main thing is, for getting their sleepy, the main aspect is they cannot maintain wakefulness. Conversely, during the night, they cannot maintain sleep. There's sort of this disconnect. They're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The balance is off. One of the interesting other aspects of na narcolepsy is that in certain, in one variant, well, probably the main one of it, you have cataplexy. Cataplexy is the sudden loss of mus muscle tone provoked by a strong emotion. Um, it can be anger. It can be laughter. In fact, neurologists used to have um, joke books so that they could try to induce a cataplectic attack in the office before we had better um, studies for this. Um, consciousness is maintained. It's a loss of motor tone. I described for you how in REM sleep you lose your motor tone. It's kind of akin to that. And it can be manifest by a head drop, um, total collapse of the body. Um, Stanford is famous, and we'll get into that in more detail. These are the narcoleptic dogs. Um, I don't know how to import a video, but you can go on YouTube and you can watch the dogs, and they're running around, and then whoops, they collapse because they got very excited. Um, they'll be back up very soon. It's very brief. Now, the story behind narcolepsy began with the search for obesity. In 1998, two, pa two papers were published within a month of each other. Um, Delici and Kildoff we're looking at proteins in the hypothalamus and trying to um, purify them and figure out what they do. So they knew they were working with the hypothalamus, so they called their proteins hypocretins. Um, they actually described pro-hypocretin and then it's two byproducts um, because it was from the hypothalamus and it looked like um, a gut hormone called secretin. The same time, Sakurai and Yanigasawa were looking at what they called orphan receptors, receptors that they didn't know what actually complex to them. So they found a chemical and they injected it into rat brains and they started to eat. So they called it orexin for appetite. Okay, so the next thing you do is you make an animal model. So they made a mouse that didn't have any orexin and they videotaped these mice. And somebody very cleverly um, was watching them and noticed that the mice kept collapsing during their active period, which is nighttime. And then they started to study them, and they saw these rats, these mice that were sleeping more during their active period than they should be. And somebody went and just said, you've got narcoleptic mice. So this became the, a second animal model for narcolepsy. This was the discovery of orexin slash hypocretin and its role in in, in, and the fact that its absence will create narcolepsy. At the same time, Mignot's lab at Stanford, who has, they have their Dobermans, and they saw in, in the Dobermans, not in people, but in their animals, that it's a problem with the receptor. So in people, they've shown that there's a 90% reduction in orexin-producing neurons, as well as little to no orexin being produced in the spinal fluid. Um, this gets us very close to the end. So now we realize that from looking for a model of obesity, they found a model for narcolepsy. Narcolepsy. And this ends up um, going to the to the flip-flop switch theory. Uh -huh.